Amanda Carby is a digital publishing coordinator with Michigan Publishing Services, a division of Michigan Publishing in the University of Michigan Library, where she focuses on digital journal production and project management. As a member of Michigan Publishing's Accessibility Task Force, Amanda works to assess and improve the publisher's accessible publishing standards. Previously, she was with the MIT Press. Kristen Waits is the digital products assistant at the MIT Press, where she coordinates the ebook production and distribution process and heads their diversity and accessibility initiatives. Her first foray into the ebook world was at Baylor University Press, where she worked as the digital publishing and production specialist. In her spare time, Kristen blogs about food, writing, and traveling. So we um, want to make clear that this isn't a talk about the technology or the specs. Um, this is about how you can work with your organization to make a tangible move toward accessibility in your workflows and processes. Um, we are going to share what we've learned in our accessibility journey so far um, and give you thoughts on how this could be done at other organizations. Um, we want to give you concrete steps for pursuing ebook accessibility um, and encourage discussion and cooperation among publishers, which is what we are all here for. Um, as a guide for our presentation, we've created milestones um, that we, some of which we've achieved in our working towards. Um, that we think are particularly important to accessibility initiatives. Those are, oh man, sorry, I have to grab the slide. There we go. Um, those are networking and research, launching a task force, composing a statement, creating a web page, conducting an audit, and adjusting your workflows, and then revising all of the above as necessary. So we'll go through all of those steps um, in our presentation today. Okay. So um, let's start with a very quick question. Um, show of hands, oh sorry, I forgot. Already I forgot. So show of hands, how many of you and your organizations are pursuing accessibility initiatives for your digital products at all? Oh, okay, that's actually more than I was expecting, so that's awesome. <laughs> um, so before we get started, we're giving you uh, a quick survey related to your organization's involvement with accessibility. So if you have a computer or a smartphone, which I imagine most people do, um, go ahead and visit this bit.ly link, uh, and at the end of our presentation, we'll take a look at the responses together. Um, we're using a Google form, so we'll be able to look at a summary of all the responses. So uh, let's get to it. Um, we're gonna give you a little background about us personally and about our organizations to give you some context, and then we'll move into our roadmap. Okay, um, so I'm Kristen. I work at the MIT Press as the digital products assistant. I've been in that position and in Boston for a little over a year now. Um, before that, I was in the production department at Baylor University Press, which is where I started working with eBooks. Um, I've been interested in accessibility since I attended an AUP workshop um, last summer, which was done by one of Amanda's colleagues. Um, and since then, I've been working on our accessibility initiative at MIT Press. And I am Amanda, obviously. Um, I'm a digital publishing coordinator with Michigan Publishing, which is, uh, as Monique detailed, a division of the University of Michigan Library. Um, I studied English in Michigan and then I moved to Boston in 2012 to get my master's at Emerson College and I love the Emerson College contingent at eBookCraft, let me just say. Um, it makes me so happy to see you guys even though I don't live in Boston anymore. So um, before I came back to Southeast Michigan, I was at the MIT Press actually in a role very similar to Kristen's current role and she's in my old department. So our similar job experiences, AKA our almost identical job experiences, have allowed us to collaborate on this project really well. Um, my interest in ebook accessibility started as I began my career in digital book production and as I became more familiar with the digital production community. Um, so yeah, that's me. So now that you know a little bit about us personally, we'll give you some background about our presses. We do come from the university press world, but we are going to try to structure this talk to apply to as many publishing organizations as possible, not just the university press world. Okay, so the MIT Press is the only university press in the United States whose list is based in science and technology. Um, we also have large lists in art, architecture, and philosophy, and various humanities subjects as well. Um, we publish about 250 new books per year, um, 30 journals, and we have a staff of about 100 people. Um, I'm in the digital products department, which is um, currently four people doing all of our ebooks, um, and I manage our production and distribution, mostly in terms of quality ass assurance and project management and things like that. Um, and then I also lead our accessibility working group. 
My description is a little long because the University of Michigan is insane, so forgive me. Um, so Michigan Publishing is a, a, a division of the library located in beautiful Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and a fun fact to share is that the university is celebrating its bicentennial this year. Um, so that just means there's lots of cool celebrations happening. It's 200 years old. Um, there's actually really cool bicentennial publications coming out of Michigan Publishing. So feel free to free to free, uh, feel free to Google and just check them out. They're really cool. Um, so. Michigan Publishing is made up of three distinct units, the first being the University of Michigan Press, which is our traditional university press. Um, it was founded in 1930, and its lists are focused on the humanities and the social sciences. We publish about 100 books a year, um, so it makes it about, it makes it, it's a mid-sized university press. It's smaller than MIT. Um, our second unit is Deep Blue, which is U of M's institutional repository. And the last unit is Michigan Publishing Services, which is the services division, um, and that's the unit that I work in. Um, my unit is dedicated to the publishing needs of the U of M community, particularly faculty and university departments. And we also publish over 30 open access journals, um, monographs and books, and a variety of other digital products. Open access is um, the uh, most important thing in our mission. Um, and my role is focused on journals production and book project management. So all of this is to say, I'm not technically an employee of the university press, um, but our units have a lot of overlap. We actually share the same office and we're always working together on pro uh, projects and tasks. And so because of that, I was able to become a member of Michigan Publishing's Accessibility Task Force, um, which I'll be revisiting in a little bit. So uh, let's get into these milestones that we've been talking about. Um, the first one is networking and research, research um, which is something that I know all of us here are very familiar with. Um, so networking gives publishers a sense of what others in our industry are doing, what sort of initiatives are taking place, especially around accessibility, and where we can all go for help and advice. So when it comes to accessibility specifically, what are some ways in which we as publishers can network? So to speak to university presses in particular, um, we're able to consult with our university uh, accessibility offices and our student disability services office, um, and we can determine what we can do for each other, what kind of information is out there um, in relation to universities, and what we can do to meet the needs of not only our campus community, but also our audience as a whole. Um, in the case of Michigan Publishing, we are able to recruit and hire an accessibility expert through the university library and she's a member of our task force. Um, so for the rest of us that aren't in university presses, uh, we can connect with any local accessibility groups, and as we are today, we can connect with other publishers who are working towards accessibility initiatives, um, or who want to start working towards accessibility initiatives. Um, that's why Kristen and I are here today giving this talk. Uh, this year's Eva Craft has had a number of accessibility discussions, including the one immediately before us, which is phenomenal. Um, and both U of M and MIT are really excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, and I do want to make note, it's not everyone is as far along in their accessibility initiatives as perhaps our presses are. Um, so having these conversations and making these connections is very important, even to us if we are a little bit further along. Um, we just want to make sure that we're as in the loop as possible. Um, yeah, so to, I guess, make that clear, um, networking is something that I found extremely important. Um, everything that MIT is doing now has already been done by Michigan, and that's because I bug them about it every couple days. <laughs> I'm like, hey, how can we do this? What are you guys working on? How can we make this work at MIT? Um, and that's been really, really helpful to me. So we are open to, you know, questions and discussion from everyone here, and I hope that you guys are able to find people um, in the crowd that you are able to connect with as well. So our next milestone is creating a task force. Um, we think it's important to have um, a group of members, a group of members of different departments of your organization um, who can come together and determine um, basically how you want to run your accessibility initiative. Um, they can help develop concrete dates and deliverables, de determine what criteria will you'll use to rate your successes. Um, they will be crucial in implementing workflow changes and disseminating information to the rest of the press. Um, so at MIT, our task force had our first meeting in October of 2016, so not too long ago, um, but we've met monthly since then. We have about 10 members from various departments, including acquisitions, editorial, um, digital products, production, and rights and permissions. Um, our goals have been to create an accessibility statement, which we will talk about later, 
um, conduct an audit, and then determine what our most important changes are that we want to make to our workflow. Um, I spent a lot of time researching and you know, talking to people before I actually decided to do anything. Um, but when I did, this was the first thing that I did. I talked to my supervisor and the director of the press, um, and then brought up a task force at one of our staff meetings, and then sent out an all staff email, um, and basically just gathered volunteers that way. Um, having the support from our director's office was really helpful um, because it reinforced the importance of what we were working towards, um, which made it really easy to get lots of volunteers and people who were interested and wanted to help. Um, so one of the challenges that we faced was educating each other on accessibility um, because we had people from lots of different departments and not just digital production. Um, there were lots of people who weren't familiar with like EPUB specs and things like that. Um, and so we took a lot of time at the beginning to just kind of get together and teach each other what we knew about accessibility and what we, and figure out what we all needed to know collectively. So the University of Michigan Press uh, created its accessibility task force in late 2015. Um, I joined U of M in 2016, so I uh, joined the task force a little bit later. Um, our first and primary goals were, and they still are, to adopt a new set of accessibility initiatives uh, aimed at publishing accessible EPUBs, more specifically to access accessibility, assess, excuse me, accessibility at our press, <laughs> access accessibility, of course, <laughs> and advise on practices for creating born accessible content, something that we've been talking a lot about in the past couple days. Um, our task force includes representatives from all of the units in Michigan Publishing. There's currently seven members, and that includes the accessibility specialist from the university library that I mentioned earlier. Uh, her name is Stephanie, and she's responsible for ensuring that all departments collaborate to implement accessibility policy. So support for her role and for our task force was endorsed by our senior managers and our director, and this helps to demonstrate the importance of accessibility throughout our organization. Um, Kristen alluded to that. Uh, this work really will, if you pursue these initiatives, and if you are already, you already know this, this work is going to really impact your organization and your workflow. So having representation from every major group is key to um, ensure things are communicated across all units. Um, and if you contract work out to anybody, you need to involve those people at some point too. Um, so back to the basics of our task force. At its inception, our group educated each other on Ally. We researched best practices. Uh, we sought out training. We consulted with experts on campus and elsewhere. Um, in addition to our goals, we decided on some deliverables for our organization. And these include uh, performing an accessibility audit of selected press titles creating technical guidelines for our production staff, so for people like me, um, creating guidelines for authors and for editors, that's key, it's not just the authors, the editors need to know as well, um, and presenting a timeline for implementing these new guidelines. And having a timeline for implementation can really help you get that buy-in across your organization, it can really help you get that support that you need, um, and it can also help you plan ahead on the different deliverables that you end up creating. So that covers our task forces and how they came about. So now Kristen is gonna move into our next milestone, which is composing an accessibility statement. Um, okay, so basically um, the next milestone is to work with your task force to create a press or organization accessibility statement, which lays out the scope of your project, um, including your current status and goals. Um, there are a few samples here, but Amanda and I go are going to talk more in depth about our own accessibility statements. Um, and how we wrote them, basically. <laughs> um, so to facilitate writing our um, statement, I cobbled together a bunch of pieces that I liked from other websites, um, and then I brought it to our task force, and we kind of all sat in the same room and just edited it together um, to make sure that it sounded the way we wanted it to, that it aligned with our mission, um, that we had the right language. Um, it was really helpful to have the different perspectives of everyone weighing in. Um, so this is our statement currently, so I will read it. Um, it says, the MIT Press is committed to making its digital content, including our website and eBooks, accessible to as broad an audience as possible. We are working towards compliance and standards governed by the W3C, the IDPF, and the Section, 8, Section 508 guidelines. This commitment is in line with our press goals of publishing and disseminating important scholarly knowledge to those who need it, which includes making all content accessible in all formats. As a university press, we strive to continually evolve to meet the changing needs of the communities of readers we serve. So for Michigan, 
Um, crafting our accessibility statement was very similar to how MIT crafted theirs. We looked for the best examples, we picked out what applied to us most, and what mo most closely aligned with our mission. Um, and our mission features, uh, it has a strong focus on open access, I mentioned that earlier, and making scholarship uh, available to the broadest possible audience. So we had to make sure that this was a focus in our accessibility statement as well. Um, so you can see the brief statement on this current slide. Um, the statement might seem short, just glancing at it, um, but if you visit our webpage, you'll see that the accessibility section is actually much longer than the statement itself. Uh, there's a fair amount of other information, including some services we offer, and some of those services are uh, for users with print disabilities, so we complete specific digital file requests, we participate in Bookshare, um, we're always accepting feedback on accessibility, and you know, there's ongoing testing and remediation. Uh, we're not going to stop improving our processes, and we make that pretty clear um, on our website. So next, we're gonna move on to our next milestone, um, which is actually creating a web page for that accessibility information and statement to live. Um, so we found it particularly important to have a dedicated web page to accessibility. Um, this is helpful for readers and authors to be able to find the information that they might need to know, um, especially where to direct feedback and request for accessible files. Um, but we also just wanted to make sure that it was out there so that anyone who's you know, curious about what we're doing um, can access that information um, without having to go to you know, a bunch of different pages or you know, search around to find the right email. Um, do you wanna? So this is what our accessibility page on our website looks like. Um, it has our statement and then the current projects that we're working on, um, who to contact if you're looking for accessible files, um, and it goes on a little bit. Um, but we found this really helpful and an important like goal to reach um, because it kind of solidified what we were working on and made it you know public. <laughs> so uh, the University of Michigan Prep, please do you enjoy my Photoshop? My skills are pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so our press currently doesn't have a dedicated web page. Um, our accessibility information lives on the about page for the press. Um, and we don't have immediate plans for a dedicated page. Our task force is act actually pretty happy with how it's structured right now, but I do want to mention that I think it's important to have um, very specific uh, guides to that information. Um, there are links on the website in various places, which is on this slide, including the header and the footer that take you directly to the information. The user, when you visit the About page, if you use one of these links, you do not have to scroll all the way through the About page of the press to find this information. If you click one of these links, it takes you directly to the header for accessibility. Um, and this is one way for your press or your organization to display your accessibility goals if you don't want to have a dedicated web page. So that's uh, milestone four, and our next milestone is, we're gonna get more in depth to the nitty gritty here. Um, our next milestone is conducting an audit of your current output. Okay, so conducting an audit of your ebook files will help you determine the current level of accessibility you're currently um, producing in your ebook. Um, the purpose of this is to help you determine near future goals based on the results, um, it will, which will help you focus your efforts. Um, this can also be a useful tool in developing recommended lists of reading systems, retailers, and platforms that are best for your readers. Um, currently, MIT Press is in the early stages of our audit. Um, we are working with MIT's Office of Accessibility and Usability, who's been um, extremely helpful. Um, so to prepare for this, we created a list of about 35 books um, from a list of books that are most often requested um, for accessible files. Um, and there are various subjects on this list, including algorithms, linguistics, economics, neuroscience, new media, and architecture, um, which means that they include lots and lots of different um, things like MathML, foreign languages, and extensive images and tables, um, all of which require different accessibility features. So we think that this is gonna be a good diverse list of books to learn about and um, hopefully see how we can improve. Um, we're hoping to understand specifically what more it will take to make our textbooks more accessible, since that is one of our large like, markets. Um, and we know it's gonna be complicated because we publish lots of math heavy um, and image heavy books, um, but those are our most used books and we think they'll benefit the most from it. Um, we are going to audit our books in-house, but also um, MIT's Office of Accessibility and Usability has offered their expertise using screen readers. So they're gonna give us specific feedback about um, 
what our books look like and what the reading experience is um, using various screen readers. Um, we also provided them with a checklist um, to basically help them in their audit um, based on the EPUB 1.0 accessibility spec. Um, and we think that, well, having that spec um, helped us a lot to, I guess, identify which problems we want to address and what we want to focus on. Um, so for Michigan, uh, conducting a title audit was one of the very first things that our task force did. We needed to see how our current EPUBs were being generated through our XML first workflow, uh, what was good, what was not so good about these files. And we looked at one or two titles from each list of the press, um, and we utilized the IDPF's ally checklist, and we looked out for specific elements, um, things like foreign language, heavy image use, mathematics, notes, tables, all the things that we've been talking about. So here's a brief list of some of the findings from our initial audit. Um, as you can see in this list, overall, what we found is that we needed to make better use of our semantic markup. We were already doing things like grouping structurally significant content in section tags. Um, we were using numbered headings correctly, but our figures and images really needed attention, need, I should say, um, and <laughs> we needed to introduce the EPUB type attribute, and there's a whole bunch of other things. This is just a brief list, um, and obviously, uh, accessibility specs go, you know, much further than what's on this list. Um, one of the most important things that we've kept in mind in our audit is something that we've discussed a lot in this conference, and it might go without saying, but publications, you know, have a primary narrative that readers are expected to follow from beginning to end, and being able to navigate this dialogue and this narrative uninterrupted is a key factor in making things accessible. Um, and the narrative flow in most publications is obvious to cited readers, but if elements like sidebars and footnotes and endnotes are not clearly marked and identifiable as secondary information, readers navigating at the markup level will have narrative interrupted, and that obviously makes the title inaccessible. So as a result of these findings, we knew that it was time to start thinking about adjusting our workflow and implementing change, and that is our next milestone. Um. So this is going to be a very short discussion <laughs> about a, an ongoing and complex process. Um, but basically, you want to develop a workflow that integrates accessibility first, um, which is the whole purpose of the Born Accessible Initiative, which has been spoken a lot about today. Um, so updating your workflow may include updating the author's guide to incorporate new requirements, um, creating or updating documentation for internal workflows, um, determining the best way to disseminate information to the rest of your organization, and also to your external stakeholders, um, most importantly, probably authors. Um, MIT is not quite to the workflow. Um, nope. <laughs> <It's been laughs> <there. Sorry. laughs> no. um, not quite to the workflow adjustment stage. We hope to be there in the next six months or, s months or so um, after we finish our audit. Um, but we are still thinking ahead about how we will want to um, communicate those kinds of changes that we're thinking about having to make. Okay, now I can do this, sorry. <laughs> so with guidance from our ally specialist in the library, one of our biggest revelations um, during the audit and it, when we started to adjust our workflow is that this is way more than just a technical project. Um, we needed to start from acquisition and follow a book all the way through production um, and introduce these ally concerns at the earliest point possible. Um, this is something else that we've been talking about yesterday and today. Um, the earlier that we insert accessibility into the process, the better off that we're going to be in the end instead of having to, I shouldn't say in the end, but the better off we're going to be overall and as you know, we continue to publish, instead of having to retrofit all of our content. Um, so in starting to adjust our workflow, we have been focused on revamping our author's guidelines and we're introducing new accessibility requirements and examples to help our authors comply with these new guidelines. So I'm going to briefly talk about our first author's guide alteration, which is image guidelines. Um, and I feel a little bit like a broken record because we've talked so much about non-visual descriptions uh, today and yesterday, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, images, maps, and figures appearing in books, we all know this, they, they must include a non-visual text description in order to make the book accessible. Um, and this is particularly when the images are central to the theme, arguments, et cetera. So in this way, readers using screen access software can still have access to these very important features of the book. 
So on this slide are some examples of uh, the language that we're using in our author's guide to instruct authors on providing image descriptions, well, telling them what we're looking for. Um, we require two forms of non-visual text descriptions, uh, alt text and full description. <clears throat> so alt text is 140 characters or less, or less, excuse me. Brief description, it's required for every image that is not merely decorative. And then there's the long description, which is of indefinite length, and that communicates information and details that are relevant within the context. Um, we require these to be delivered in the same format as captions because we copy edit them. We are not leaving it to the authors to copy edit them. Remember that. <laughs> um, we are also providing authors with examples of textual descriptions, and we make a point of noting that good textual descriptions depend on the context. They don't need to repeat information um, that's already in the text. So basically, we try to make our accessibility needs as clear to our authors as possible, um, even if, uh, you know, this language that we're including in our guidelines might seal, seem a little long-winded, but we just want to make it as clear as possible and, you know, uh, don't have too many questions back and forth. So once we get descriptions from our authors, here's an example of an image in one of our titles and how the descriptions come into play. As you can see, there's an image. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, part of the caption got cut off. Sorry about that. I have no idea why. I promised that it was a normal caption. But anyway, imagine that that is a full caption that has like figure one, et cetera, et cetera. I do not know how that happened. Apologies. Uh, but that's where the caption goes. It's usually typically under the image. And then in the code, you'll see both the alt text and the image description. Um, and that's, that's how we include them into our code at this point. So uh, that concludes our details and my uh, Michigan's examples about adjusting your workflow and implementation that you can start to bring in little by little. And so now we're going to go into our last milestone, which is diligent and repeated revision. <laughs> So basically, as we all know, things with accessibility are changing rapidly. Um, and so in order to not only keep up with standards and the industry, um, but to keep up with what you, um, to keep the information that you're giving to the public up to date, you should continue to revise your statement, your web page, and your workflow as necessary to reflect the progress you've made. Um, other things that you can do are consider doing periodic audits to, det to determine how far you've come. Um, and then you can also consider um, exploring possible future endeavors for accessibility, um, since we know that ebooks are not the only um, avenue for this. Um, so some things that you can look at are ensuring that your website is fully accessible, um, that other electronic content that you might provide, it, like podcasts or blogs, are also accessible, um, and then ensuring that your content is being sent to vendors who focus on accessibility, and continuing to research new and emerging standards. So we're going to switch over to my computer, and we can actually look at these responses um, in real time, and hopefully we can have a little, little bit of um, question and answers if there are questions, have a little bit of discussion about um, some of the responses here. And keep, feel free to keep responding, of course, if you haven't had the chance to yet. Um, so here we can see, uh, on a scale of one to five, five meaning very dedicated, how would you rank your press or your organization's dedication to making, ooh, look at that, boom. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Technology, uh, dedication to making digital products accessible. And it looks like there's a fair amount that are very dedicated, um, but it looks like it's mostly middling, um, which I think is good, to be honest. Um, I think that being at least starting some initiative and starting to have these conversations and think about it um, is pretty important. I'm going to scroll down here and see about if you're currently making accessible EPUBs. And the majority says yes, which is, again, excellent. Um, I would even say that Michigan, we're starting to, but like uh, on the whole, they're, they're not all there yet. We're doing them on like a case-by-case -case basis. So if you are already doing that as a matter of course, then that's phenomenal. Um, let's see here. Oh, whoops. Those are my notes. Okay. So... Uh, this is something that I actually want to have a question about. Um, for those of you who, I won't, we can, we can leave this up. For those of you who your organization is not yet uh, 
producing accessible content or pursuing any of these initiatives. Can any of you speak to why that might be? Um, there's a question down here a little bit further about what um, the biggest hurdles are. Um, so maybe that can be related to this question, but it, is, is anybody comfortable talking about like why you're not there yet or um, what you might be doing in the future? Um, my company is interested in accessibility and I kind of sneak stuff in when they're not paying attention. Um, but in general, the um, upper management doesn't really see a return on investment at this point. And so they're um, concerned about starting it too soon because things could be changing. So they kind of want to hold off until distributors and retailers are demanding it. Uh, I work at an indie press here in Toronto. And so really our entire digital production department is right here in front of the microphone. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> For us, it's hard, it's just basically time and resources in order to, um, to mm. allocate the time and resources in order to do that, but uh, it is something uh, that's important to us as an indie press. We try to make our books available to anyone who, is, who wants to read them, mm. so it's something that uh, is on our radar, but it's just difficult to fit it in with our schedule. Thank you. And I think, um, so to speak to that, I completely understand. MIT Press is a huge staff, but our department is very small, and I do almost all of our ebook. Um, and so time is really difficult, and I think that getting, being able to get other people on board helps a lot, um, because you can split up the work and also convince people that it's not just something that you have to be doing yourself. It's something that should be done throughout the entire workflow. Um, which, you know, gets rid of a lot of the pressure and the time requirements on you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I would like to ask about um, these milestones that we have talked about today. Um, these are the things that we have been pursuing at our presses, and I am certain that there are perhaps other ideas about other milestones that you can reach or um, other specific tasks that need to um, be done. Um, I hope that these, I hope that the ones that we've talked about today, um, I hope that you're able to apply them to your organization and your workflow. We have found them to be pretty helpful. And as you can see, we're still in the process of incorporating these accessibility goals into our workflow. And as the case with any press, with any publisher, with any operation, it's gonna take time. And it's going to take manpower that you might not necessarily have. Um, it's going to take that support from your higher ups. Uh, so I think that Perhaps we'll, as time goes on, we'll you know find more milestones to reach, and um, we'll just continue to improve our processes. Yeah. There. Okay. So, I think this is an interesting question: which milestones people think are important? Um, almost everyone said adjusting your workflow, which makes sense. <laughs> that is the actual <laughs> tangible you know product of this. Um, and then conducting an audit is next, and networking and research. Um, I'm curious, and this trend showed up in the last question as well, um, mm. whether or not people think that composing a statement and having a web page are less important, and why? Um, and I guess, is that something that you're looking to do in the future, um, or do you think that it's fine not having it and just continuing as you are? Yeah. Um, I've had to write several guideline documents and things that we were hoping people in our publishing house would follow. And whenever I ask someone, well, did you read the instructions? No. <laughs> so what we found was writing that kind of thing was actually really helpful for us to wrap our minds around our goals and the specific things we had to do. But as far as reaching out to people, it really just happened a lot one on one. Uh, yeah, I was just going to suggest maybe this is reflecting the difference between academic and trade publishing in that uh, trade publishing, and you know, we don't expect our customers, readers, to be on our website that much. And so it's probably less, less important what we say um, than what we just do, I guess. We uh, do a lot of digitization for accessibility as well as some production. and. Um, we have a lot of, I think, ideas around web presences and uh, statements that we would write, and a lot of that did happen, but what we found was that, because our users are also mostly at universities and colleges, they, they're, we sort of think like, the library's at the center of this, but the local accessibility offices were already so keyed into things that that was 
who our users spoke to. They already had people on campus, so um, uh, they, they wanted us to do that work, but, but uh, we were not the face of that. I work with a lot of international organizations like the UN, and, and uh, they already have a mission statement related to accessibility, so there's no need for each individual um, uh, organization to do the same thing. So. Liam Quinn, W3C. And I just checked our own homepage, and we don't have an accessibility statement. <laughs> so <laughs> we're in the process of uh, looking at redesigning our, our way uh, resources and web pages. But I will take that feedback back to our team and see if we can make an accessibility. Awesome. <laughs> Everything we do is accessible, but we don't say that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Be loud. Be proud. <laughs> I'll just throw out there too that yeah. um, when you put an accessibility statement on your website, there is a way in Onyx 3 to actually point to that and say, mm -hmm. this is our standard, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. And that's helpful for a consumer who's trying to figure out, well, what can I expect from this publisher? Mm -hmm. uh, am I expecting them to meet WCAG standards? Am I expecting them not to and just to do some accessibility? Do they have a plan for the future? You know, those things are visible to people who are concerned about accessibility and mm -hmm. could go out with your metadata statement to your retail trading partners uh, yeah. and, and be helpful to people who are engaging that. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks, yeah, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of this, like the statement and the web page part, go a lot um, in hand with accessibility metadata and having that actually in your eBooks. Um, because really what we're trying to do is make sure that the people who need the books can find them and know that they are accessible to them. Um, so those are all in the same wheelhouse there. Um, do we want to read some of these? Yeah, we can do that. Um, we just asked if you have any, uh, what have you found helpful that m we haven't discussed yet? So resources and things like that. Um, technical training, of course. Uh, automation, which is something that we really haven't talked about, but I do think that that would probably be helpful in the future. Um, trying to bake accessibility into everything we do. I think that if we can take one message away from these accessibility talks that we've had at this conference, I think that that might be a really key statement. Bake it, bake it like a cake. Bake it into everything that you do as a publisher and your output will be better off for it and your audience will grow. Um, there's just a ton of benefits. One of the things that I really took away from what you guys were saying was um, what you do to educate your authors. And I was wondering if you could share some insights, like what did you run into as you were, you know, wh what's been the response from your authors and what challenges did you find? Unfortunately, um, that hasn't quite happened yet. I know exactly what you're asking and I wish that I had direct feedback, but as of right now, we're working on what to say, if that makes any sense. We're working on the language and how to include these into our author's guidelines. Um, and we've had a, a couple books that we've worked on these descriptions with our authors, but unfortunately we haven't done um, a ton of asking for these descriptions just yet. We're still in the process of making sure that we have everything organized before we, oh sorry, before we provide it to the author. So unfortunately, I don't have a ton of um, personal insight as to how the authors will react. Um, but that's why we're, at Michigan at least, we're trying to focus on making it as clear as possible um, and just conveying the message of what accessibility is and why it's important. And um, I'm hopeful and I'm pretty confident that our authors um, will respond uh, positively. Um, so we've actually started to have those conversations, and um, I think the biggest challenge that we're facing, both within our company and outside the company with authors, is the cultural shift that needs to take place in order to get people to actually accept that accessibility is something that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and there's a couple of different methods that we've used in order to address it, both with the authors and with the, our internal employees. One of them is actually bringing in people that can talk to them about um, needing accessible technology um, and why it's important for educational programs. So we worked with um, the organizers of Blind New World, which comes out of Perkins. Um, and uh, we have an author who's very involved in the hearing impaired community. He came in and talked to us for, about, for um, some of the stuff mm -hmm. that put more of a human face on it. Yeah. So we got less of the like really horrendous um, anonymous feedback from people where they were like, why am I doing this for 1% of the population? Who cares? Right? Everybody <laughs> groaned. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, but then the other thing that, that we face as a problem is trying to figure out how we can convince people of the, the traditional curb cut argument mm -hmm. and how it relates to digital publishing. And that's still something that we sort of struggle with. So um, what we want them to, to see, what we want them to embrace is that they might benefit from accessibility even without the need for accessibility. Yeah. Um, and the, the curb cut argument obviously reflects this in that the curb cuts on sidewalks were kind of pushed against um, as a change, but ultimately anybody wheeling a suitcase or with a baby carriage has um, benefited from those curb cuts being there. So any chance that you have that you can find that you can say, this is working better for you because we implemented this accessibility standard. That's what made the huge difference in cultural shift. That's really great advice. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.